When you start learning about Roman history, you encounter a lot of new names. However, at first, they're all distinct and easy to remember. Caesar, Caligula, Marcus Aurelius, everybody knows to whom those names refer. When you get a little deeper, you start seeing some duplicates, but they aren't too difficult to deal with at first. Like there is a guy named Cato who said that Carthage should be destroyed, and there's another guy named Cato who wanted to execute Caesar for bribery. So to tell them apart, we'll just call the first one Cato the Elder and the second one Cato the Younger. There are, of course, three generations of Catos in between those two, but those Catos aren't famous enough for us to care. But when you dig a little deeper, you start noticing stuff like people having five names. There's 20 different people named Publius Cornelius Scipio, and every Quintus Fabius is called Maximus, even though you thought that Maximus was the guy from the Gladiator. And then you go just another Wikipedia link deeper, and... Yeah. It can certainly be hard to understand what the hell is the deal with Roman names, so in this series I'll do my best to explain how the Roman names worked, and what each of the names was for. Roman naming customs weren't static and changed throughout the time, so in the first video we're going to cover the development of the famous Tria Nomina, and the naming conventions of the Roman Republic. Some of the earliest inhabitants of the city of Rome might have had only one name. It is partially attested in the legend of the city's foundation, in which the commoners like Romulus, Remus and Faustulus have only a single name, while the members of nobility like Rea Silvia and Amulius Silvius have two. However, around 650 BC, the Latins adopted a binomial system with one heritable element called nomen and one individual element, or praenomen. The binomial naming system is of course very common for Indo-European languages. The unique feature of Latin, in this regard, is the relative importance between the two elements. While we, and a lot of other people throughout history, generally think of our personal name as our main name, for the Romans, the family name was the most important. The secondary role of the Roman personal name is reflected by the word they used for it. Praenomen simply means before the name. The nomen told to which gens this particular Roman belonged. That's why it was also called nomen gentilicium. A gens is a wider extended family, sort of a clan. All members of one gens claim to be the descendants of a single ancestor. As the tradition states, at the time of Rome's founding, Gentes were divided into patrician and plebeian, but later, as marriage and adoption laws became more liberal, this distinction became less rigid. As Rome grew in power and influence, the Roman society absorbed Gentes from the conquered cities, but the original patrician clans remained the most prestigious well into the imperial times. Among the most powerful and influential were Aemili, Claudii, Cornelii, Fabi, Manli, and Valerii. Each of those had a lot of consuls and distinguished hunters in their ranks. Men used the masculine form of the nomen gentilicum, Fabius, Manlius, Cornelius, while women bore the feminine form, Fabia, Manlia, Cornelia. The central role of the nomen in the full Roman name reflected the importance of the familial identity for the citizens of the Republic. They were first the members of the gens, and had to uphold their family name. Both the glory and the shame that they earned belonged to their family as much or even more so than to them personally. While there were around a thousand different Roman nomina, the number of personal names was very limited. Varro lists around three dozen different praenomina, and there are 56 unique ones known to historians. But 99% of Roman males of the regal and republican period shared one of only 17 of those. In the Roman Kingdom and Early Republic, women used to have praenomina, which were the feminine forms of the male praenomina, like Gaia and Lucia. But by 350 BC, the female praenomina completely fell out of use. All of the praenomina used to have some kind of original meaning. Some of these names are numerical, like Quintus or Sextus, meaning fifth and sixth. The name Postumus, which means last, also refers to the order even though it is often associated with the word posthumous for children born after the father's death. 
other prinomena have meaning related to the circumstances of birth. Pliny the Elder lists a lot of this kind of etymologies, although it is unclear how many of them are actually true. For example, Lucius, according to Pliny, was the name for a child born at the first light. Tiberius was for the children born near the river Tiber. And Queso was for those who were cut from the mother's womb. All of these rules may have had some basis in the tradition, but obviously weren't followed strictly. Most noble families named their first boy after his father, and the rest after other male relatives. This meant that there would be a favored prinomen for each family, which would be prevalent in every generation. Gens Claudia favored Appius, Gens Cornelia favored the names Publius and Lucius, and Gaius Julius Kaiser had a whole bunch of distant uncles and cousins who shared his full name. To differentiate between daughters who didn't have prinomina, the Romans used the order adjectives. If there were two daughters, the older would generally be called major and the younger minor. If there were more than two, then they would be assigned the number Cornelia prima, Cornelia secunda, tertia, quattra, and so forth. Men could be referred to by either both their prinomen and nomen, or simply by the nomen if the context allowed. This was the custom outside the family. Within the family, they were referred to simply by the prinomen. Women were officially addressed to by their nomen, but between the family members, diminutives were employed to tell the girls apart. Little Julia would be Yulilla, and little Tule can be Tulilla, Tuliola, or some other affectionate form. The Italian attitude towards names wasn't shared by their neighbors and diplomatic partners. This led to some gaffes. Greeks, who placed higher importance on the personal name, referred to their Roman counterparts by the prinomen, something that would only be done by a family member or a close friend in a Roman society. The other uniquely Roman element of the full name was the cognomen. It was placed after the nomen. Cognomen started simply as a nickname, but later became a family name in its own right. As the gentes grew in size, prinomena were no longer sufficient to tell apart members of the same gens, so Romans started doling out nicknames. Those nicknames came from a variety of sources. They were often based on physical appearance or character trait, like crassus, meaning fat, or nasica, which means nosy. Some of these nicknames became hereditary and started to designate a branch of the gens. These branches, or stirpes, are what is usually called Roman noble families. Some of the most famous of them are Carneli Scipi, Semproni Gracchi, and of course Iuli Caesari. The origins of some cognomina were very famous, like the story of Marcus Valerius Corvus. Jan Marcus Valerius was a military tribune on the campaign against the Gauls in northern Italy. Before one of the battles, a huge Gallic warrior challenged any Roman to fight against him in a single combat, and Marcus accepted the challenge. As the combatants approached each other, a raven swooped down from the sky and perched on Marcus's helmet. When the duel began, the bird attacked the Gallic giant. Making use of his opponent's distraction, Valerius landed a killing blow, rallied his troops to battle, and scored a great victory for the Romans. From that day, he adopted the cognomen Corvus, which means raven. Another legendary cognomen is that of the most famous of Caesar's assassins, Marcus Ionius Brutus. Although it wasn't earned by him, but by his legendary ancestor and a co-founder of the Roman Republic, Lucius Ionius Brutus. Lucius Junius was a nephew of the last Roman king, Lucius Tarquinius Superbus. When he was in the company of his royal uncle and cousins, he pretended to be dim-witted, which earned him the nickname Brutus, meaning stupid. But when the right moment came, he revealed his true stature and led the overthrow of the tyrannical monarch, forever banishing him from Rome. Not all cognomina, however, had such legendary origins. Most were just ordinary nicknames of the prominent Romans, who decided to distinguish their bloodline from the rest of the Gens by passing their nickname onto their sons. 
A personal non-hereditary cognomen is sometimes called agnomen. Most of those were the so-called cognomen ex virtute, personal honorifics awarded for great deeds. These titles were often given to generals for significant victories. The most famous victory title of the Roman Republic is certainly Africanus, the agnomen awarded to Publius Cornelius Scipio for his victory over Hannibal at the Battle of Zama. His younger brother Lucius, not to be outdone too much by the older sibling, earned himself agnomen Asiaticus for his conquest in Asia Minor. Another common reason for gaining an agnomen was adoption. When a noble Roman was adopted, he would take his adoptive father's full name. He would also add a suffix to his former nomen and make it a cognomen. This is how the most famous Roman adoptee, Gaius Octavius, became Gaius Iulius Caesar Octavianus. Cognomina are the reason why later Roman names are so ridiculously long. Sons would get some of their father's cognomina and add their own, and on and on it went until we got to this guy, who had 38 names. Now, these huge names may leave you under the impression that every Roman citizen had at least three names. This wasn't the case. Only the most ancient, influential and powerful families, or gentes maiores, had a lot of branches. Some other families had a couple of branches, while most of them didn't have any cognomina at all, so the majority of Roman citizens only had two names. The two most famous Romans without a cognomen are probably Gaius Marius and Marcus Antonius. Cognomina first started appearing in the late Kingdom and early Republic era, but did not become common until much later. They also weren't recognized in the official documents until the 2nd century BC. The rise in popularity of the cognomen changed the female name in conventions as well. In the early Republic, women did not change their name upon marriage. But now a married woman could add her husband's cognomen and genitive case to her own name to signify her new marital status. If Cornelia marries one Valerius Catullus, she can be known as Cornelia Catulli. This is not to be confused with Cornelia Catulla, who would have been a daughter of Cornelius Catullus if born in the late Roman Republic. The custom of women using the feminine form of their father's cognomen also became popular during that age. Marcus Licinius Crassus, for example, had two daughters, Licinia Crassa Maior and Licinia Crassa Minor. The combination of prinomen, nomen and cognomen is known as trianomena, which means three names. It is often presented as the definitive naming system of ancient Rome. This is somewhat misleading, as a rigidly defined and widely accepted convention Trianomina only existed for a little more than a century. In the next video, I am going to show you how the Romans already started to subvert this custom in the early empire. The guy who had 38 names lived in the 2nd century AD, and his name does not follow Trianomina convention at all. So this was a brief review of the early Roman naming customs. If you have any questions for me, feel free to ask them in the comments. Join me next time when we will discuss the naming conventions of the Roman Empire. We will also learn how to read those long inscriptions and find out why so many emperors added PP into their list of titles. Thanks a lot for watching till the end, and I will see you in the next one.